So I'm here at the School of Advanced International Studies, uh, Johns Hopkins Science, where I used to teach, and I'm talking to Yasha Monk uh, about his new book, The Identity Trap. Uh, and I'm really happy to be speaking with him because he makes an argument for a kind of classical liberalism that I've endorsed myself. Uh, but before we begin, um, you know, we're doing this on October 13th, which is less than a week since this terrible attack by Hamas uh, on Israel. And one of the things that struck me is the reaction of the left around the world, uh, that they've been, you know, so quiet that you wouldn't even know that they exist until this happened. And then you see all these big pro-Palestinian demonstrations. And it's very hard to imagine any of them being similarly motivated, you know, on behalf of the old proletariat, you know, the white working class. Uh, and that seems to me a little bit uh, illustrative of the kinds of changes that you're talking about, you know, in your analysis of, you know, the rise of what you call the identity synthesis. Yeah, I mean, it's been a terrible week and, uh, you know, the most important concern should be with, uh, you know, over a thousand victims of this terrible terrorist attacks uh, uh, perpetrated by, by Hamas, um, uh, Jews and Israelis, but also people of every other faith and many other nations, Canadians and Americans, Chinese and people from Thailand, uh, Germans and French people. Um, and of course, I'm worried about... Um, you know, what escalation we're likely to see in uh, Israel and in the region over the following days and weeks. Um, but, but for me personally, there has been something surreal since I'm in the middle of sort of my book tour for the identity trap. And the question that I've gotten over and over and over again from TV hosts, uh, radio hosts, podcast uh, hosts is, you know, why worry about what's going on on the left? Why worry about the rise of a new set of ideas about race, gender, and sexual orientation. Perhaps we might sometimes be a little bit misguided, but surely the only real threat is on the right. So wouldn't, you know, uh, isn't there something slightly strange with your obsession about talking about these things, right? Now, mm -hmm. I'm somebody who's warned, like you have obviously, about um, the genuine danger from the populist right for a very long time, and I continue to be extremely concerned about it. But I think we've seen over the last week uh, why it is important to talk about the genuinely bad ideas on the left because they have, uh, you know, inspired organizations like the Democratic Socialists for America, um, like chapters of the Black Lives Matter movement, to celebrate this terrorist attack, to uh, issue invitations to protests, to pro Palestinian solidarity rallies, in which they actually picture uh, some of the uh, paragliders um, who uh, murdered uh, over 250 people at this rave in southern Israel. Uh, we've seen universities, including institutions that both you and I are affiliated with, um, that, you know, at very rapid speed have in the last years uh, issued statements on all kinds of uh, political issues, on Supreme Court judgments and on, um, uh, you know, police shootings of unarmed civilians and of events in the United States and around the world. Uh, failed to say anything about the biggest terrorist attack on Jews since World War II for days and days and days. Uh, and then, in many cases, come out with very mini mouth statements that seem to uh, equate uh, 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 that terror um, uh, with other events in, 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 in a way that, that uh, is, I think, morally uh, deeply shocking. And so I do think that to understand uh, both why uh, the left is more uh, interested in uh, these identitarian causes than in class politics, and why even within the realm of uh, advocating for the victims of various forms of identity-based injustice, which is certainly uh, one important thing to do in politics, um, they have thrown out of a window universalist and humanist values that would allow them to recognize that Hamas terror attack for what it is. So um, the part of the um, identity synthesis you talk about in your book is anti-colonialism. Um, you know, in a way, I guess the question that occurred to me when I read it, so I, uh, 
in a way, was introduced to identity politics uh, by my mentor, Alan Bloom, who wrote a best-selling book back in the late 1980s called uh, The Closing of the American Mind. And I think that that was the first moment at which um, you know, there was a broad attack against, let's say, Western universalism. Uh, and one of the important components of that was Edward Said and uh, you know, his book, Orientalism, that basically argued that much of the scholarship going on in American universities was really Eurocentric. It was biased in favor of a Western interpretation of you know, historical events, but this applied to you know, things like philosophy, which was also seen as simply a siloed you know, European uh, phenomenon. Uh, so tell me about the new synthesis. You know, how is that those strands that were present all the way back then merged with newer uh, you know, intellectual trends that now uh, result in what you call the identity th synthesis. Yeah, so, 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 so the book is really trying to understand and analyze the rise of these new set of ideas about race, gender, and sexual orientation, which I think we really are novel political ideology, one that is different from right-wing or conservative traditions, but also significantly different from what the left used to believe. And so in the first part of the book, I tell the intellectual history of this. In the second part of the book, I explain how these ideas could come to be so influential in mainstream institutions, um, making university presidents scared to acknowledge Hamas's attack in the same way that they do so many other events. Uh, in the third part of the book, I critique the application of these ideas to many areas from uh, cultural appropriation to free speech and race-sensitive public policies. And then finally, in the fourth part of the book, inspired in good part by your work, I make a defense for a classical liberalism that can take injustices seriously and articulate why they are a problem and how to overcome them, um, but without uh, falling into the identity trap. So, uh, you know, in terms of figuring out where these ideas actually come from, I was really struck by the paucity of work on that. There mm -hmm. really isn't very much work within academia in trying to understand these ideas. Yeah, well, a lot of it is very polemical. Uh, yeah, so that's sort of, uh, you know, there's a lot of people saying, well, these ideas aren't really new, they're just what sensible people believe, and if you don't, there's something wrong with you. Mm -hmm. Then there's people who are attacking them very polemically, and that's it. Mm -hmm. um, now, the people who attack these ideas polemically tend to say that it's a form of cultural Marxism. Right? Um, and I was open to that idea. I did the reading to figure out whether or not it might be derived in some way from the Marxist tradition. But I think that that turns out to be wrong for two reasons. The first is that Marxism is effectively an ideology uh, about uh, economic categories like social class. And so to take social class out of Marxism is a little bit like taking the bat out of baseball. You're mm -hmm. just left with too little for it to make sense. Mm -hmm. And secondly, when you actually go back through the Marxist thinkers, through Karl Marx himself, but also people like Antonio Gramsci, the Frankfurt School, you know, people like Theodor Adorno and Max Horkheimer, you don't really get the themes of our contemporary social justice politics. And so the story that I tell starts with uh, the postmodern rejection of grand narratives, including both liberalism and Marxism. Uh, it is Foucault's deep skepticism about the idea that there are objective truths or universal values. Um, his belief that French society uh, was flattering itself, wrongly flattering itself, by thinking that we've made progress in how to treat prisoners or the mentally ill or sexual minorities. By his rejection of identity categories, interestingly. Foucault was, in our terms, a homosexual, somebody, a man who had sex with men. But he did dislike that label. Uh, he thought it was mm -hmm. too constraining and essentializing in worrying ways. And then finally, his concept of power, which is based not on you know laws passed in a democratic or other process by the state and the bureaucracy and police force that apply and enforce them, but rather on the idea of discourses in which we're continually influencing each other, in which this conversation is an exercise of power. Um, the post-colonial thinkers who you mentioned were simultaneously very attracted to and repelled by these ideas. Mm -hmm. They were attracted to their quality as universal solvent, as a way to criticize all of the ideologies that were prevalent at the time, Marxism and liberalism included, uh, and that had historically helped to justify uh, colonialism. Um, but they were repelled by the somewhat apolitical implications of Foucault's philosophy, by the idea that any discourse is as constraining as the other, and that there can't really be uh, 
systematic progress. So they set about repoliticizing what Edward Said calls Foucault's notion of a discourse. Mm -hmm. And so Said is one key step in this, uh, showing the way in which Western representations of the East, of a so-called Orient, um, had played a key role in justifying colonialism. Uh, but then going a step further than Foucault and saying the point is not just to describe this, the point is to change it, is to invert the discourse in such a way that those who used to be denigrated and weak become strong and uh, uh, prestigious. Um, that has inspired a key form of our politics today. When we're talking about politics today, some of it may be advocating for laws, uh, but a lot of it is praising, critiquing, critiquing, rendering problematic the Barbie movie. Mm -hmm. right? That's a res recognizable form of politics, but it's downstream from Said. Mm -hmm. The second key step is another post-colonial thinker called Gayatri Spivak, um, a uh, Indian uh, literary scholar who uh, makes her name by working in the post-modernist and post-structuralist tradition by translating Derrida, for example, um, but she's really struck when Foucault says that uh, intellectuals should no longer, as Marxists would have done, speak on behalf of the oppressed, on behalf of the proletariat, um, because uh, this would involve these essentializing ideas of identity, like what is the proletariat, what is the working class. And she says, look, that's fine for Foucault to say in France, perhaps white um, uh, working class uh, people can speak for themselves in France, but the most was your subaltern in the third world, the most oppressed in places like Kolkata, they can't speak for themselves. They haven't had the education. They might not be able to read and write. They don't have the resources. Somebody has to speak for them. And so she wants to speak on their behalf. So she coins this concept of strategic essentialism, which is supposed to recognize the postmodern critique of essentialist notions of identity, but then embrace essentialist account of identity nevertheless for practical political purposes. And again, that helps to explain parts of our social justice politics today. If you go to an activist meeting, somebody might say, um, of course, race is a social construct, but then go on to talk about what black and brown people want, or what mm -hmm. BIPOC demand. And that is uh, strategic essentialism in practice. So one of the things I think that's going on in the world is the way that a lot of these ideas are actually drifting from the left over to the extreme right. Uh, and I think, you know, I mean, this is what I've argued, uh, that this begins with Foucault in many ways, because one of his big targets was modern natural science. You know, the idea that the scientific method, you know, was a means to getting empirical truth about the world. And uh, he was very skeptical. I mean, he regarded that as a version of, you know, of power. And, uh, you know, I even, uh, in a way, labeled him the first conspiracy theorist in the sense that, you know, he argued that, you know, in the old days, kings used to just order subjects killed if they didn't like them, but you couldn't do that anymore. And so now you had to manipulate them by cloaking your power in the language of modern science. But in fact, it was really just a tool that you were using to, you know, to manipulate people. And this is exactly what's happened now on the, you know, on the right. I mean, you see this during the COVID epidemic where exactly, you know, those words are coming out of the mouth of a lot of conservatives saying, uh, you know, the, the public health authorities aren't scientists. They they're basically are power mad people that, mm. you know, want to hold dominion over us. Yeah, there's a strange swap that has happened, right? It's 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 like, uh, uh, you know, after the after the you know historical thinkers draft, uh, the left decided to uh, uh, you know trade Foucault off to the right, um, and the right decided to trade uh, Carl Schmitt off to the left, <laughs> uh, and so you 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 see the kind of proud prevalence of this friend enemy thinking. Mm -hmm. Um, that stands at the core of Carl Schmitt's work being celebrated and defended uh, in many intellectual circles on the left. And then you have people, including uh, some of the most influential advisors to Vladimir Putin in Russia, really uh, playing with and drawing on the postmodernist tradition. Um, uh, and, and I certainly think that there is a postmodern element to the politics of somebody like Donald Trump. Um, and that helps to ground 
his uh, resistance to not just experts, but broader notions of truth mm -hmm. in, in important ways. Now, um, I think what's interesting about the sort of origin of these ideas on the left, though, is that they start with Foucault, um, but then go through a number of evolutions through Said and Spivak and later through critical race theorists like Derek Bell and Kimberly Crenshaw, such that the ideology in its modern form would have uh, seemed quite shocking to many of its originators. Mm -hmm. um, so Spivak um, starts to worry uh, later in her life uh, that uh, strategic essentialism just becomes what she calls the union ticket for a more vulgar form of essentialism. And she ends up mocking what she calls the identity wallace at American universities. Mm -hmm. um, uh, Said in the 1990s says that the point is not to revel in being a victim. The point is to overcome victimhood, to make sure that people aren't, to, you know, that people's lives aren't determined by the group into which we're born to the same extent. Um, and Foucault himself, who passed away in the 1980s and didn't quite live to see this new ideology take shape, I think would have been deeply skeptical of uh, some of the, for lack of a better word, cancel culture we've seen in the last years. Mm -hmm. um, you know, he was obsessed in his work with the Panopticon, which had been um, uh, championed by Jeremy Bentham, uh, you know, the, the, the sort of guard tower in the middle of a prison with cells uh, arranged around it in a spherical way so that the prisoners would never know when they're being observed. Um, and Foucault's worry about this was that it wouldn't just allow the guards to punish very effectively, but it would induce the prisoners to self-discipline. An anticipatory act of obedience, not knowing whether they're being observed or not, that would govern themselves uh, before even being punished. By the guards and um, you know what is uh, Twitter and Facebook <laughs> and the imposition of uh, unspoken, ever-shifting norms of what expression of use will get you into trouble and what expression of use is allowed, other than a modern-day panopticon. Yeah, of course, the Chinese government has an even <laughs> more controlling uh, version of this than than what exists on Twitter. Well, I have to. Um, you know, confess a certain part of my autobiography because when I was an undergraduate at Cornell, postmodernism hit um, that university, you know, really hard. This was in the early 70s, and I actually spent a year in Paris studying. I went to Jacques Derrida's lectures and Roland Barthes, and I actually met Foucault when he visited Cornell. My only real memory of him was him disappearing upstairs with a bunch of young men in tow, and then we didn't see him for the rest of the <laughs> rest of the evening. Um, it did seem to me that, uh, you know, what I ultimately decided about that movement as a whole was that they, you know, they had two commitments. One was the deconstructivist one, to basically say that there are no grand narratives and there's no scientific authority and, and, and so forth. So it was essentially a form of, you know, Nietzscheanism. Uh, you know, nothing is true, everything is just an interpretation. But they were also committed to equality, uh, to a kind of radical equality that, uh, you know, spoke to their roots on the left. And they never really managed to reconcile these, that if you really believed in the Nietzschean part, you could just as easily come to the conclusion that, you know, the equality of marginalized people is is just a narrative, you know, uh, expressing the, their will to power. Uh, and, you know, why not prefer the stronger to the weaker? Uh, and in a way, I always thought that Nietzsche was much more honest than any of them, you know, in term. But you seem to be saying that actually the egalitarian commitment in the end was more important to a lot of those people than the in a way, the nihilistic framing from which they started. Oh, that's very interesting, yeah. Um, you know, I have a related thought, which is that there is a seeming contradiction that I've been grappling with in how you can be skeptical of parts of postmodern enterprise when the categories of postmodernism have evidently become so influential in society. Um, so it seems to be a sort of self-fulfilling prophecy. If you're arguing that, um, you know, what really uh, 
drive societies of self-interest and power and all kinds of uh, different instincts and that to think that these uh, you know, objective scientific institutions like the Centers for Disease Control um, are driven by a process of scientific discovery rather than by bureaucratic constraints and self-interest and um, uh, you know, all of those things which would make us very skeptical about any claims to objective truth. Uh, and then those uh, bodies become captive to many of those ideas. Mm -hmm. Well, that seems to prove the thing, right? <laughs> so how can I, as somebody skeptical towards postmodernism, refuse to believe that it's true? Um, <laughs> I think it's a seeming paradox mm -hmm. because you can distinguish between uh, the existence of an objective truth and the commitment to universal values that persist uh, even as you recognize how difficult it is for them to actually be in charge most of the time. So I do actually find postmodern categories quite helpful in helping to understand how uh, many of our institutions were captured by these ideas over the last 10 mm -hmm, years. Mm -hmm. But that doesn't mean that there isn't any truth. It just means that it is very hard to build human institutions that consistently track the truth. Um, and I think this is, I had a discussion with somebody about George Orwell and Michel Foucault, because Orwell and Foucault, I think, are actually similar in their concern about how truth can be undermined, how easy it is for the lie to win out. Um, but I think the, the crucial difference is that Foucault takes the uh, implication that therefore there is no truth, and it's not a very helpful category. And Orwell says, no, that is precisely why we must fanatically be committed to defending the truth at whatever cost, because that's the only thing we have, and it's something that can get lost very, very quickly and easily. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, so that's my attempt to sort of grapple with the uh, postmodernist project myself. Now, in terms of what won out, I think what's interesting is that the tension you talk about is very evident in how the ideology evolves. But all of the skepticism about, about grand narratives gets thrown overboard. Right? I mean, what does Spivak do? She reinscribes identity, even though she comes regretted in certain ways. She reinscribes identity at the core of the enterprise. Right? She mm -hmm. says, all right, we've gotten rid of liberalism and Marxism and all of those things, but we actually have to recover identity in order to be able to do politics. And today, what I call the identity synthesis has itself become uh, one of the more simplistic grand narratives that have structured politics. Mm -hmm. Right? Everywhere... Uh, you have to understand the world through the uh, prism of race, gender, and sexual orientation. Mm -hmm. And the people who have historically been oppressed are always the virtuous ones. Uh, in a strange way, it is neo-colonial because you're looking at a conflict like the one in Palestine or like uh, one's happening in East Asia and see it through American political terms, <laughs> right? Uh, Whoopi Goldberg said that the Holocaust was not about race because there weren't any black people there. Um, you know, I saw a newspaper headline at one point talking about uh, uh, what the CCP government doing in Xinjiang as a form of white supremacy. <laughs> because in their mind, if there is, you know, an ethnic majoritarian group that is suppressing minority groups, it can't be uh, its own form of uh, uh, ethnic politics mm -hmm. that posits a um, uh, supposedly superior or more legitimate entity over another. It has to be white identity politics yeah. and white supremacy. Yeah, I guess the Egyptian government is trying to reclaim Nefertiti from American, African Americans who have a theory about a black, Athena, I mean, basically that uh, Mediterranean civilization, including the Egyptians, were really, you know, black uh, Africans, and the Arabs don't like that idea. Well, and, and but this is really um, where we see how difficult it is to maintain norms of truth and how lightly American mainstream institutions have rolled over. Um, you know, Netflix has produced a documentary uh, which is arguing that Cleopatra was actually black, mm -hmm. which is just complete historical nonsense. Now, I have no problem, by the way, if it's a movie, and a fictional movie, and for whatever reason they decide to uh, cast a black actress, fine by me. Uh, let's take artistic license, let's play with historical material. That's perfectly fine. I saw a lovely movie um, on the 1988 uh, uh, presidential uh, primary election in which uh, the young uh, journalist E.J. Dion, uh, somebody who I believe you probably know and I know, a, a white Catholic American, lovely person, 
is played by a young black actor. I, uh-huh. this, this is great. Let's turn EJ into why not? No problem. But when you're talking in the realm of a documentary, making this claim as a historical injustice that Cleopatra is not being recognized as black and has the imprimatur of mainstream American institutions when it's evident historical nonsense, um, you see both uh, how easy it is for those norms of truth to be undermined and um, how corroded many American mainstream institutions mm-hmm. have become. So let's get back to the point you made early on um, that this is something that we really ought to be seriously worried about. What's your answer to the argument that this uh, identity synthesis is something that many young people believe? I certainly see that in my own you know, students uh, uh, at Stanford, but that um, you know, they're going to grow up eventually. I mean, everyone in France was a Marxist in the 1950s, and you know, by the 1990s, they were all middle-aged, worried about their pensions, and you know, ceased being Marxist. Do you think that we could see a similar fading of you know, this particular view of the world, or is it going to be more permanent than that? Well, what, what we could, it depends on what all of us do, right? <laughs> uh, one of the things that strikes me about that analogy mm-hmm. um, is, you know, I, I've interviewed um, Danny Cohn Bendit, uh, Danny Le Rouge, one, mm-hmm. one of the leaders of the student movement in 1968 in Paris. And he said, you know, thank God we won on culture and thank God we lost on politics. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, it's a little. Uh, overly simple an interpretation of 68, but there's something important to it. Um, you know, students at my high school that I attended a few decades later um, in Munich marched down this main street of a city shouting, Ho, 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 Chi Minh, Che Guevara, Lenin. Well, thank God that those did not come to rule Germany, or at least Western Germany. Um, uh, and there certainly were many important cultural causes that 68 has won, but there's also some that they lost for good reasons. The difference is that in the 60s, there was a quite self-confident and to a significant extent avowedly conservative establishment that stood at the other side of this battle. And that created the clash of ideas, uh, which allowed good ideas like greater acceptance of sexual minorities, like more sexual freedom to win out, and bad ideas like Che, you know, Ho 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 Che Guevara Lenin to lose. Uh, the people who are in charge of American institutions today and institutions in many countries in the West that I know, um, first of all, see themselves as descendants of the student protesters of the 68, not of the administrators of 68. So they're already uh, inclined to roll over. Uh, and then I think have just imbibed um, a, a get along to go along attitude, which has made them incredibly pliable. Mm-hmm. And so we now see the most extreme and radical ideas ensconced in how we do things in a way that I think didn't happen at the time. So, you know, in the book I describe those and they go well beyond uh, cancel culture. They go well beyond the stories of this person or that person being fired. Mm -hmm. I'm also concerned about that. I think I'm not at the core of this. They're, you know, some of the most elite private schools in this country now having teachers go into third grade, second grade, first grade classrooms and telling uh, students to separate by race, saying black students should go over there and Latinos should go over there and Asian, Amer- Asian Americans should go over there and whites should go over in that fourth classroom, something that might be that is inspired by strategic essentialism, that might m- be meant to in- encourage uh, intelligent forms of resistance against injustice, but that I think are much more likely to create um, racists than anti-racists, mm-hmm. white supremacists, mm-hmm. rather than white students who declaim their privilege. We've seen the Centers for Disease Control during the COVID pandemic refuse to suggest that vaccines, uh, life-saving vaccines, um, go to the elderly first, uh, even though because of the extreme uh, correlation between age and vulnerability to COVID, the CDC's own models showed that this would have saved between 0.5 and 6.5% of fatalities. Mm -hmm because the elderly were disproportionately white, something that um, ultimately made way too many people eligible at the t- same time um, and who was able to you know, refresh the CBS website, drive to far away pharmacies, uh, you know, pull strings to somehow get an appointment, the most privileged people. So it actually had really bad consequences also for disfavored communities. Um, uh, but when you, 
when you see that happening, I think that's a disanalogy. Um, mm-hmm. You know, the most extreme ideas in the 60s and early 70s did not gain entree into the mainstream uh, with that speed. Um, yeah. One of the things that has been the most amazing to me is the way that um, so much of the um, health community in at least Anglophone con- uh, countries has accepted, you know, the ideology underlying a lot of the transgender activists, you know, that there's no connection between biological sex and gender, and that gender is essentially a completely voluntary uh, idea, uh, which for a whole bunch of reasons just seems to me empirically very questionable. But, you know, it's been really actually written into law in a number of states and, you know, uh, an idea that kind of spread like wildfire. It's, it's a little bit hard to see, you know, how that how that happens, but uh, I guess it's not the only, you know, example of that. Yeah, and one of the things that I found striking is that increased focus on a new concept, which might in itself be helpful, then supplants any consideration of an older concept in ways that make us incapable of understanding the world. So take the concept of structural racism. Uh, which is, I think, a helpful concept, right? When you think, this is a slightly old-fashioned example because of the rise of Uber and Lyft and so on, but when you think of uh, the classic example of uh, an African-American who wants to hail a cab um, and he has money to pay for the cab, perhaps he lives in a perfectly safe neighborhood, um, but the cab driver, who may not be racist in a first personal sense, he may not have negative views about black people, he may be black himself, mm-hmm. is going to say, oh, you know what, uh, given the structure of our society, perhaps this person is going to want to go to a neighborhood that is more dangerous or to a neighborhood where it's going to be harder to pick up a client. So I'm going to drive past this person. Right? So clearly there's an injustice here, even if uh, nobody in this example, you know, holds first personally ob- objectionable views. But uh, in the way that racism is now taught by administrators at many universities, in the way it's defined in some dictionaries, it has become exclusively structural. So you have lost the more old-fashioned definition of racism as involving hateful views towards people. And it has the implication that it is only possible for a member of a supposedly more privileged group to be racist towards a member of a supposedly less privileged group. Yeah. And so when, uh, you know, a few years ago there was a anti-Semitic uh, shooting of a number of uh, Jews at a kosher supermarket in Jersey City, um, perpetrated by uh, 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 a black Hebrew Israelite, um, a religious group that has uh, long-standing anti-Semitic beliefs, uh, newspapers weren't willing to call it anti-Semitic, mm-hmm. and willing to call it a terrorist attack, um, and certainly weren't willing to call it racist, mm-hmm. um, because uh, they had completely taken over this new conception of racism as exclusively structural. Mm -hmm. And so I think when you come to sex and gender, we have a similar problem. Um, Biological sex is a fundamental category that is important in many contexts, some medical and some others. I think gender can be a helpful concept. Clearly, we do have gender roles and expectations that differ from society to society, but constrain how people want to live. And there are some people who clearly have a very deep-rooted desire to live uh, within the gender roles um, that do not correspond to their biological sex. And mm-hmm. I think that we should uh, respect them and treat them with great consideration and make sure that they don't get discriminated against. But there are going to be some contexts, perhaps not many, but some, in which the demands of sex and the demands of gender come to be in conflict with mm-hmm. each other mm-hmm. when it comes, for example, to whether or not athletes who have gone through male puberty should be allowed to uh, compete at the highest levels in female sports. Um, And there, if we are unwilling to use the category of sex, we say using the category of sex itself is transphobic, then we're not going to be able to understand those trade-offs and find humane solutions to them. Mm -hmm. There's another issue that um, I don't think you discuss quite as much, but it really had to do with the role of culture and what to me, makes the whole concept of equity um, problematic. I mean, so you talk about the difference between equality and equity and how there's been an acceptance of the idea of equity that uh, involves a kind of assumption that if outcomes are not equal across races, that the cause of this is racism or white supremacy, 
uh, or whatever. Whereas it does seem to me that there's an awful lot of evidence that you know, in the aggregate, groups are going to perform differently uh, for a lot of different reasons. I mean, the main, you know, case of that is Asians in the United States. I mean, it's hard to believe that white people actually want Asians to do better than them and displace them in elite universities, but that's, in fact, uh, what's going on, and the cause of that seems to me to have little to do with, you know, uh, uh, discrimination, but everything to do with kind of the, the cultural habits of you know, different groups of people. Yeah, I mean, the other interesting example for that is uh, the very differential performance of groups of whites, uh, which is uh, less often pointed to. Um, so, for example, uh, French origin Americans um, do extremely poorly on many socioeconomic indicators. Um, uh, that's not because, uh, you know, the French people coming in here with H-1B visas uh, somehow struggle, um, but because of a particular population of uh, French immigrants from Canada in the 19th century who ended up in parts of New England, who for various reasons have historically been uh, uh, socioeconomically underperforming. Uh, and that continues to be the case today um, in striking ways. So I agree with you that sort of we can't operate with an underlying assumption that uh, every uh, sociocultural group will have the same outcomes, and therefore, if they don't, uh, that is uh, uh, incontrovertible proof of some form of discrimination. Yeah. Um, uh, more broadly, though, I think that the problem of equity is troubling for deeper conceptual reasons. Um, you know, and this, I think, the Marxist, uh, African American philosopher Adolf Reed Jr. is quite convincing. But really, the, the, the notion of equity, um, which he rightly calls a race disparitarianism, mm -hmm. is uh, concerned about the disparity in the performance of different racial groups. Um, but that's compatible with the idea that we could have an America in which 13% of billionaires are black. But the billionaires have all the money and everybody else is incredibly poor. Mm -hmm. From a perspective of racist puritarianism, this would be a just society. But from a more old-fashioned uh, perspective of a class-based uh, left, it would be a very troubling society. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Perhaps I'll share with you something that's not in the book um, but that I, I don't think I've talked about publicly before, which is a different way you might be able to get to equity in the United States and quite plausibly will. Um, we see... Uh, that, um, uh, you know, uh, on average, African Americans continue to be lower in income and much lower in wealth because of the obvious historical injustices that they've experienced, and that is a difficult thing to overcome over time. We also see immigrants from, from Kenya and Nigeria and other African nations do extremely well, in good part because many of them, like immigrants from India, are H-1B immigrants, so they come uh, because of their high qualifications, they then bring in other family members who often also have high qualifications and the children are very successful. So I think in the United States, we might in 50 or so years get to uh, a genuine equity in which on average, uh, black Americans will earn about as much money and will perhaps have as much wealth as white Americans. Um, but if the composition of that equity is such that uh, uh, black Americans are split into a group of uh, very affluent descendants of African immigrants and descendants uh, of enslaved people mm -hmm. who continue to live in genuine poverty and uh, uh, many of whom continue to live in genuine poverty and cut off from many opportunities. It, it's not clear to me that that would be a very just outcome. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So let's conclude by talking about the positive virtues of liberalism because that's really the um, set of ideas that's been under direct attack by the identity synthesis. What's your case for why we should stick with a liberal society? Yeah, so I think there's, there's two cases here, and they're both influenced by your work. The first is a response to really the main claims of the identity synthesis. We've talked a little bit about some of the themes of that theory, but I attempt in the third part of the book, sorry, in the fourth part of the book, to really boil these ideas down to three basic claims. It's an exercise in modern philosophy is called uh, rational reconstruction. Mm -hmm. And I think there's three main claims that this tradition makes. Number one, that the key prism for understanding society is race, gender, and sexual orientation. Robin DiAngelo, one of the most uh, successful popularizers of this ideology, has once said that 
every time a white person interrupts a black person, but bringing the entire apparatus of white supremacy to bear on them. Which makes me think that D'Angelo doesn't have any black friends. Because part of friendship is that you sometimes interrupt each other, as we have today. Um, secondly, the claim is that universal values and neutral rules, uh, like those enshrined in the founding documents of the United States, um, are just an attempt to pull the wool over people's eyes. That their true purpose is to perpetuate forms of racial and sexual and other domination. And that, therefore, as people like Derek Bell has argued, we haven't made any progress on them. That America in 2000 was as racist as it was in 1950, as racist as it was in 1850. Something that, by the way, I find offensive, not because it impugns the honor of the great Americans living today, but because it uh, uh, underappreciates the extent of suffering of past generations. Um, and third, if you believe that the world is all about identity and that um, we haven't been able to make any progress on these things because of the hold of universal values, well, then you want to reject them. And you want to say, let's make how we treat each other and how the state treats all of us explicitly depend on the kind of identity categories to which we belong. I think that there's a very coherent liberal response to these three points. One that takes injustices in our society seriously. Uh, one that recognizes the importance that identity plays in certain contexts, uh, but without throwing the universalist baby out with the bathwater. And that's number one to say that, of course, race, gender, and sexual orientation matter, but so do other categories. Marxists were right that in some categories, social, in some contexts, social class matters. Um, theologians are right that in many contexts you can't understand uh, history or politics without uh, thinking about religion. Um, patriotism and nationalism matter as social forces and individual attributes, the choices of world leaders or the aspirations and the actions of individual citizens matter for understanding the world, especially social situations as well. Secondly, it is true, as Frederick Douglass said, that America has always been hypocritical. Uh, when he held his famous speech celebrating the 4th of July, he said, how can you talk about all men being created equal when all over the country, uh, my brother and I held in chains. Um, but progress came precisely from what he said next, which is don't rip up the Constitution, don't rip up the Declaration of Independence. If you mean those values seriously, live up to them. By what virtue, by what right are you excluding me from full consideration in this society? That is also what people like Jonathan Rauch and Andrew Sullivan, who were among the first to argue for same-sex marriage, have pointed to as the secret of success of a gay rights movement. They first had to win the fight against members of the gay rights movement who said marriage is a terrible um, you know, bourgeois institution that's oppressive and we want to queer society and get rid of those institutions. No, they said, we want to have the same respect. We want to have the same protections for our relationships. We want to also have the protections of marriage. That was the key argument. But love is equal, which helped to win much greater respect and equality for sexual minorities, including gays and lesbians. Um, and so that's why we have been able to make progress. That's why it's a mistake to say that America is as racist, as homophobic today as it was in the past. And so therefore, the right solution is to fight to live up to our values and our principles. Um, and that is sort of 50% conservative and 50% radical or progressive which is to say that we want to hold on to our ideals. But I think liberalism, rightly understood, is a progressive creed, um, one that wants to bring reality into closer alignment with its ideals rather than to say that everything is already all right. No, absolutely. I think, actually, um, you know, the best uh, illustration of the power of that idea is Abraham Lincoln arguing with Stephen Douglas, who took the phrase, you know, from the Declaration of Independence that all men are created equal, which was belied by American practice at the time. But he said that implies that democracy does not trump, um, you know, the right of human beings to live in dignity, as uh, the Southerners were, were arguing. Uh, and so I think even if it's an unfulfilled ideal, it's, it's pretty important in driving forward the idea of what's possible in terms of progress of a society. I think that's right. If you allow, I, 
I'd love to say one more thing because uh, many parts of his book are inspired by by your work, but, but this in particular, you know, the, the book is called The Identity Trap. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think that metaphor includes a, po- a few points. The first of it, there's a lure um, that you have to understand why a lot of young, well-intentioned people are attracted to these ideas. And I think that comes from this false premise, false promise, but, but an inspiring promise that it's going to be the most radical, the most consistent, the most uncompromising uh, uh, you know, fight for, for getting rid of injustices. And Max Weber says that politics is the slow boring of hard boards, and so it's understandable that some people will always be attracted to an ideology that claims, let's get rid of this politics and substitute it with something else. And yet it ends up being a trap. It's a political trap. Because, of, as we've seen in the last years, it makes it harder for important institutions to do the work because they end up with internal meltdowns. Because um, equity-inspired policies like that uh, way of distributing COVID vaccines often end up harming those that they are uh, supposed to help. Um, in this case, if you give uh, you know two vaccines to 25-year-old Uber drivers, uh, who are black, rather than one vaccine to an 80-year-old retiree who is black, more black people are going to die. So I actually think this policy likely increased the death toll among non-white Americans as well as among white Americans. I think it's a political trap in the most straightforward partisan sense uh, because uh, even for superficially uh, right-wing populism and this left-wing identitarianism are mutually exclusive ideologies, so ones that oppose each other, In practical terms, they strengthen each other. Um, In 2016, it became very hard to argue against these ideas on the left because people felt genuinely threatened by Donald Trump. But it is the hold of these ideas over so many mainstream institutions that helps to explain why Trump is now running neck to neck with Joe Biden in uh, electoral polls for 2024. Um, But Beyond the political trap, I think it's also a personal trap. And that's uh, where I think I'm inspired uh, by your work specifically, which is that I agree with you that most humans seek some form of recognition in society and that this is an important dimension of politics that we often overlook. And one of the appeals of the identity synthesis is to say, you're going to define by your particular intersection of identities and then you're going to fight on behalf of those groups, and that's what's going to give you that form of recognition. But I think that is a fraudulent promise, because my brother stands at a very similar intersection of identities to me. But if in the world I was seen in identical terms to my brother, I don't think I would gain that form of recognition and social standing. Um, uh, The conservative critique of wokeness is that it's all a bunch of unique little snowflakes. I think human beings are, in fact, unique little <laughs> snowflakes. And they certainly identify with various groups. They certainly can't be denigrated on behalf of a group membership if they are to gain that belonging. But, but part of uh, the individualist liberalism you have to defend is that ultimately the place you need to be able to find for yourself in society, to feel seen in the right ways, to be reconciled with the social institutions of which you are part, cannot exclusively be reduced to ascriptive identities. It has to have something to do with your individual tastes and beliefs and uh, idiosyncrasies and attributes. Well, I think um, that is certainly something that gets lost when you essentialize, you know, these characteristics. And I think that is, you know, one of the chief dangers that uh, uh, this type of policy, I mean, I think as a mobilizational tool for marginalized people who want to be treated equally, there's nothing wrong with identity, but when it becomes, you know, what most defines you, uh, apart from who you are as an individual, then I think, you know, you lose something by that. So, Yasha Monk, thank you very much. That was really terrific. Uh, good luck uh, uh, with the book, and, uh, you know, thanks very much for talking to me. It's an honor.